the webinar, um, both here on Zoom as well as on YouTube. So um, just hang tight and we will get started here shortly. Now, can I move around at all? You'll follow me if I'm going to turn this way. Don't move too much. Okay. I can span the camera. Okay. But I don't want to okay. pick this up and lose connection. Okay. We're really excited to have everyone here. Awesome. I think we are good to go ahead and get started. So thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Ashley Denninger. I'm the manager of consumer programs here at the Ohio Beef Council. And we're really excited today to have you all here um, and travel to Key Car Farms with us in Danville, Ohio. Um, so just a little housekeeping before we go ahead and pass it off to Keith. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the Q&A section. Um, and if you're on YouTube, feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, we'll kind of filter through and kind of look for good places to ask those questions. Um, and we'll try to get as many of them answered as we can. So with that, we are going to go ahead and pass it off to Keith Kaufman of Key Car Farms. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, <clears throat> We're excited to, to uh, sh share our operation, Key Car Farms, with you this morning. Um, my wife, Carmen Jo, and I uh, started this operation in 1988. Uh, we moved here from, we're both natives of uh, Miami County and moved up here in 1988. Uh, started uh, Angus Purebred Seed Stock Operation, and uh, we've been going hard at it ever since. Uh, as you see here there's about 107 acres available here for the operation uh, we have about 90 acres dedicated to pasture uh, and option on a couple fields to make hay and then we do intensive grazing also here and so on that 90 acres we have about 29 different uh, paddocks and so forth that we can move cattle to and from and so we're here uh, talking about uh, beef production and a cow calf operation. We're in a lot of fall calving cows. Uh, these babies were born about three or four weeks ago and uh, they, uh, they enjoy the, the fall that we're having right now. Super weather, sun shining. Uh, we also here in the background see uh, a, a piece of equipment it's called a creep feeder. And that creep feeder is uh, has slats on the front that the baby calves can get into and the cows can't. So obviously creep feeder means that the calves can creep away from the mothers and go in there and eat feed. And what they're eating right now is a, a pellet feed that uh, is in the trough at all times. Uh, very uh, palatable that they can eat it very well. And it, it helps them to, uh, to grow high in protein and uh, so, so we get started off that with them. And then when we wean them, uh, it's not such a stress on those calves when they come off the, the cow. And weaning means to take the calves away from the mothers. And we do that at about uh, seven months of age, 205 days roughly. And then uh, put them on a, a more of a grain diet. Uh, our operation here is a seed stock operation. We save heifers uh, back, heifer calves, that's the female calves, uh, to build our herd or possibly to sell. We also have a set of bulls that we uh, move every year, uh, feed them out until they're yearlings or so, and then uh, sell them to other cattle producers across the state, in a county across the state, um, for uh, breeding purposes. So with that, uh, we, we have... So the cows are pretty calm. My group of cows, we work with them often. And when you do rotational grazing, you're with them a lot of, 
uh, a lot more than if they're just turned out on a big pasture and you only see them every other day. So that helps with the docility. That docility is a word that they use for calmness. And uh, that's pretty important. The older you get, the more important that is. So anyway, um, we're going to kind of look at these cattle uh, and then transition over to the next segment of the beef industry, which would be weaned calves uh, after we're done with this group. Uh, we're fortunate that, that both of our daughters are involved in the, the cattle business also, uh, one more than the other. Uh, we have granddaughters that uh, show Angus cattle uh, at the local level, the state level, and even at the national shows. Uh, and they're building their own herds. The other grandkids are uh, just using 4-H pro projects, uh, using heifers and steers uh, for that purpose. So uh, it, it's nice to see that the cattle business is going on to the next generation and hopefully on to the third generation down the road. Um, we have over to my right here a mineral feeder. The mineral feeder is, uh, I'm mounted on an old truck tire so that I can hook my ranger to it and pull it to uh, different lots when we move in our intensive grazing program. And the mineral is just a granular mineral. We have to supply the, the feed, the, the mineral for the animals, uh, just like you have to take, your mom tells you you need to take vitamins, uh, and that's for a reason to keep you healthy and your body growing. The same purpose with the mineral. It's, it's a loose granular mineral, and they consume it at, uh, at will whenever they think they need it. They lick some of it up, and uh, that's, that's the basis for that. So really, when we look at the operation and rotational grazing this time of the year and through the summer, uh, very low maintenance on the cows uh, as far as uh, what we have to do as managers. Uh, they pretty much take care of themselves, eating grass, moving it through. And uh, there again, you know, we on our rotational grazing, uh, the kind of the theory is there, uh, eat half, leave half. When they eat half of that lot, we move them on to the next. And then by the time they come back around full circle, the regrowth is there and, and they continue that cycle throughout the summer. Right now, of course, it's fall and, and things are slowing down a little bit, but we've had, we're fortunate to have had plenty of rain and uh, our, our grass is, is pretty abundant. It's nice and green and still growing. So, um, can you show us, um, Dan, a little bit up close and personal, like what that feed looks like that's in those feeders? Can sure. I bring those up to that camera there? This is the feed, the pelleted feed and creep feeder. And once they're weaned, then they go to a different kind of ration, might have more whole grain in it. Uh, but this is highly digestible and carries a protein uh, uh, amount in it that uh, the calves need at this age. And, and how many times the, a day do they eat, Dan? Oh, it's, it's uh, I, whenever they want to. They may be in there. They were just in there a little bit ago. So they go in at will. And uh, whenever they feel like a little snack, they go in and have that snack and uh, go back out and nurse the cow. And so, uh, yeah, it's in there full time. Awesome. Perfect. We have another question that came in. How many animals do you guys have on your farm? Well, you know, that's a question often to ask. And we do embryo work where we have a cooperator and uh, we put embryos in their cows and then we buy them back at weaning time. And so there's a lot of cattle moving in and out of here. And sometimes I really don't know how many are here. And uh, so I, I took time to count the other day. And right now there's uh, 98 head here total, cows, calves, uh, uh, weaned heifers, and so, and bread heifers. So yeah, that's, that's where we are right now. And what is a head of cattle? Is that a just head of one? Cattle? Is that, yes. That, what is one? that is one individual. Okay. Yes. So there's 98 individuals here. Great. Again, feel free everyone. If you have questions as we're going to go ahead and leave them in, um, so feel free at any point and we will go ahead and get those asked. All right. 
We don't have any other questions at the moment, Keith. So is there anything up here that you want to keep going with? Uh, nothing really here. Uh, oh, well, well, we'll get into some identification, how we identify the calves. And as you can see out here, the cows all have tags in them. They're all red tags and there's writing on them uh, to identify when they were born, who their sire was, who their dam was, and by sire meaning who's the daddy and the dam who's the mother. Uh, those are terms we use in the cattle business and, and other livestock uh, enterprises. So um, we, we will have a little demonstration on that later as we move on, uh, how we do that and, uh, and, and more of a purpose, uh, what it serves. We just got another question in. Um, okay. Are your um, cattle outside all day, every day? Uh, yes, they are. I, uh, my cattle are outside year round. The only time they get into the barn is if uh, maybe the, a cow's going to have a baby calf and the weather's kind of inclement, we can put her in the barn so we can keep a better eye on her. But then it's when that calf is born uh, and processed by vaccine uh, shots and tagging, they go back outside. Um, they will stand the winter pretty well as long as they have good nutrition and good feed to eat uh, to keep their body warm. Uh, they do grow more hair in the winter time, obviously, to uh, help keep them insulated. But uh, our cattle are very seldom in the barn. Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're just, they're outside. Great. Couple other questions before we move on. Um, when you do come to feed your cattle, um, do they all come running after you? Are they pretty calm? Do they know it's feeding time? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Well, yes, uh, we will see evidence of that when we move on into the uh, weaned heifer group in the field because we'll feed them and uh, you'll be able to see that actually happen and they'll come to the feeders and start to eat feed. Yes, they do. And just, we have another question. So can you talk about what's behind you again, really quick? What that little house uh, as, type thing is? The little house thing is called a creep feeder. And as you can see, there's openings on this end that are small that the baby calves can get into, but the cows can't. So that's called a creep feeder. And then we put this pelleted feed in there in a trough and it's got a hopper on the back and then it just feeds down as they eat. So they can go in that creep feeder anytime they want to during the day or night and nibble on a little, some of the pellets. Great. And how many hours a day do you spend, Keith, taking care of your cattle? It varies from day to day, but normally it's, uh, you know, get up in the morning, uh, get everything fed, Everything checks. I check cows every morning, every evening. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well, uh, I've not spread out a, a great number of acres, so it's pretty easy to check them. But just to make sure that uh, everybody's doing well, uh, healthy. Uh, and so at least if I do nothing else with the cattle during the day, it, it's an hour, hour and a half in the morning and same thing in the evening. Great. Awesome. Okay. And I do, and we have a ranger, we have two rangers, Polaris rangers, and uh, that makes things a lot, a lot handier, um, especially uh, in the cold weather. Um, it's kind of nice to get in there and shut the doors and have some heat while you're checking and doing all the things. Uh, that need to be done during the winter time. Yes. We also have some questions coming in from YouTube. And do you name your cattle? And how do they respond when you bring new cattle into, you know, your herd? Uh, we have pretty much a closed herd. Uh, which we, as far as bringing older cattle in, of course, with the cooperator and ET program, we have to bring those calves in in the fall. Uh, but as far as naming them, no. Uh, sometimes they get named things that, yeah, anyway, uh, we don't name them. We identify them by a number. And when we 
uh, if you look at the tags, when we get down to the barn and the working facilities down there, uh, I, I use a tag, a number system like this year it's uh, 2000. So I have a 20 and then the the calf number as they're born. So first calf born this year was 2001. And then we progress up that way. And so all the information's on that tag. Yes. And so some of your cattle have different color tags. Can you talk a little bit maybe about that? Or do you want to save that for a little bit later? No, we can talk about that now. Uh, you see all the adult cows have a red tag in their ear. The baby calves, and I don't know if you can see that here or not, uh, some of them have a yellow tag and some of them have a red tag. The yellow tag calves are bull calves and the red tag calves are heifer calves. So that gives us an idea. We can tell the distance, uh, you know, they're bulls or heifers, male or female. Great, awesome. All right, well, I think we are good here. If you would like to transition and maybe talk a little bit about the equipment that's on the other side of you. Okay. Some of the equipment that we have here, uh, not being a grain farmer, we don't have a big investment in equipment. We just have forage equipment. So obviously we have a couple tractors. One, uh, they're hooked to the baler. It's kind of the utility tractor. And uh, we do a lot of different things with it throughout the season. The bigger tractor has a bush hog, a brush hog hooked to it that we clip the pastures uh, every couple times a year usually, mainly to keep uh, some regrowth coming back and keep the weeds down, uh, hopefully from going to seed. Um, the baler, it's a New Holland uh, 450 baler. It makes a bale that's four feet wide and up to five feet tall. I can adjust that, uh, that height. Uh, they can make a 60 inch bale or, but I usually run about a 58 inch bale. Uh, and that's evidence of the bale that's there. They have poly wrap on the bale. That helps preserve the, the, the bale better than just twine string. Um, the disc mine that's over here to our right uh, is for cutting the forages. Uh, it has a disc uh, with little blades on it that rotate, cuts it off. We can mow when the conditions are, are uh, wet. Uh, we used to have sickle bar mowers that would plug up when uh, the forage got wet we were trying to get it cut. But that, that machine is a super nice machine. It windrows it, uh, puts it in a windrow, gathers it up uh, like in a row down through the field. As I look over to the right there, uh, the yellow piece of equipment is called a hay tether, and if we can hook that up, it runs by PTO. We can spread the hay out so that it creates more surface area and fluffs up to get a more drying action, uh, and we can get it baled quicker that way. To the left of that is uh, the hay rake. That hay rake hydraulically goes down, forms a big V, and creates a windrow that is as wide as the baler pick up and uh, then that piece of equipment to the left of the, the blue tractor, the Ford New Holland tractor, is probably the most versatile piece of equipment on the farm. It has three different attachments, a pallet fork, uh, bale spear, and also the dirt bucket. Uh, so it's, uh, that's one of the most important pieces of equipment on the farm. Uh, over to the right here, uh, behind the disc mine is uh, our Polaris, one my Polaris Ranger, and that is a lifesaver. Uh, every day it gets used for multiple purposes. And even I have a riding buddy with me, his name's Ryder, and uh, he's, our, he's our farm dog, about a year old, uh, half border collie and half blue healer. So uh, he's not trained. He's not out here with us because he's not exactly trained uh, well enough to be out here with the cattle because we may be chasing cattle if, if he was here. But we might get a glimpse of him later on today. Yes. And while we're here, can you explain to them the purpose of hay and, you know, why it's important? The purpose of hay is that uh, once 
So we're at the 1st of August and we're still fortunate to have grass. But by the end of, or excuse me, October, but by the end of October, we get some heavy frost. The, the grass stops growing uh, and eventually what they eat will not grow back. So once we get to that point, we have to supplement them feed. So the hay is the supplementation through the winter. So we feed these round bales. Uh, I use the uh, Ford tractor, the New Holland tractor with the bale spear on, and we have round bale feeders, and I should have had one of those here, but they're made out of poly material. Uh, we set the bale ring in the lot wherever the cows and the calves are, pick up a bale, go get a bale, pick up and set in there. So that bale services all the cows that are in there. They can get around it. That's, it's about an eight foot diameter ring. And uh, whenever it's empty, we go get another one and put in there. So that's, that's the use of the hay. It takes about 300 uh, bales, round bales like that one to uh, get us through the winter. Yes, and we just had on the screen there a moment ago your winter supply. So all of them got to see that. Yep. That's yeah, great. it was a good hay year this year. Good. All right. Well, I think we are ready for you, Keith, to head on down to the barn and we will um, have a video playing on rotational grazing while you guys do that. Okay, we're going to go look at the, uh, the weaned heifer calves at this point. Okay. Correct? That's fine. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So we are going to be playing a video now on rotational grazing and just the importance of what that is and how it helps Keith and his um, production. We're out here with the, it's kind of the heart of our rotational grazing system. This is what we established first uh, 32 years ago. Uh, this was a hay field at that time. Uh, the rotational grazing system has really developed over the years. It's been used in other countries like New Zealand and Australia for years before we uh, uh, brought it into the United States. But it, the theory behind it is that you can ex raise more cattle, run more cattle on the same number of acres by uh, letting your grass regenerate after it's been pastured through once. So uh, there are <clears throat> five lots here that are uh, running east and west uh, and there are about two and a half acres per lot. I can divide those again in, uh, in half so now I have ten lots. Depends on the number of cattle I'm running through. Depends the number of uh, how many days are going to be on that pasture. Uh, but anyway it's just kind of like mowing your lawn. If uh, you didn't mow your lawn it would eventually stop growing but we mow your lawn every week sometimes twice a week if we have a lot of moisture so that's what's making the grass grow once we get the cattle off they quit eating it we still have leaf surface we're going to eat half leave half still have leaf surface for the photosynthesis to take place and it regrows so we just we'll start on lot uh, one we'll row through rotate through the next nine lots and when they're done with the last nine out of the ninth lot the first one that they started with will be grown has grown back and uh, hey we'll start the whole process over again plus the fact when they deposit their manure it's on that same ground i mean they're putting nutrients right back into the the soil that they're digesting eating and digesting uh, we enhance that with a pasture drag uh, made out of spikes and, and little circles of iron and it spreads those cow patties out. Uh, now we're covering more square inches or square feet of ground with that same pile of manure instead of concentrating it all in one spot. Uh, a lot of times you see pastures where the grass is real tall in a round circle up. That's because that's where that cow patty is. Uh, and all the nutrients went into that spot. We tend to spread them out uh, these have been in here for 32 years and we have not used commercial fertilizer on these pastures in the last 32 years. We do haul some manure on the pastures, um, <clears throat> but that's all the nutrients being added. We do take soil tests for lime or for uh, pH level. 
if it's uh, somewhat acid, we will put lime on to sweeten the soil up and, and make all the nutrients work better that way. Great. So now we are near Heath's heifers. So Hannah, you want to unmute him? There we go. So go ahead, Keith. Okay, we've moved over to the uh, larger pasture here with weaned heifer calves in it. There are 20, 20 heifer calves here. Some of them were produced on this farm. A lot of them uh, have uh, come from our cooperator herd that we work with down by Gambier. Uh, they put embryos in uh, his cows and then he calves them out. And at winning time, I buy them back. And uh, so that's what we're looking at here. This group of heifers have been weaned for about a month now. They're out on grass, as you can see. They, uh, and we feed them a little grain. We feed them, uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of ground corn and some protein pellets in it. I say protein pellets because all young animals need to have pro protein in their diet, just like you as a, as a young person to develop bones, muscles, and, and keep you healthy. So we have to supply that w for them. And so they get fed twice a day and it helps in, in management of the cattle also. Uh, it, it becomes kind of timely. They know when it's supposed to happen. And we're running a little late here today because usually they're fed by now, but I'm gonna take this bucket of feed and put it in the uh, feeders. They'll all move over here and you can see them come at you. Come on. Come on. Everybody has a way of uh, calling their cattle, say, come on. And you are right here. I think they know that this is not a usual morning for them. Yes. They're Double on their way. What's going on, though? Here they come. Here they come. In the beef cattle world, uh, different breeds have uh, what they call EPDs, and EPDs are a measurement of certain traits. And one of the EPDs is, measures docility. And uh, docility means how calm they are. And we pay a lot of attention to that in our breeding program because it's, it's nothing more uh, problematic than to have a bunch of cattle that are always in high gear whenever you try to work with them. So, so it's, uh, and Karma Joe does a lot of things here also. Uh, so it's, it's pretty nice to be able to manage cattle and not have to worry about getting hurt or anything else like that. So here they are, now they're lining up. These, uh, like I said, these, uh, most of these are embryo transfer calves. There are a lot of full sisters in here. There are uh, probably three different sire groups and there may be three or four full sisters in each one of those sire groups. And what I'll do is uh, we'll evaluate them phenotypically. We'll evaluate this group uh, by their EPDs and EPDs that, uh, again measures, let's say birth weight, uh, weaning weight, yearling weights. So I'll analyze all that. One thing that uh, uh, has come about in the last few years is another part of technology in raising seed stock uh, is DNA testing. So I have pulled blood on, on these heifers when they were baby calves and sent it into the American Angus Association and they do a DNA test. That DNA test comes back and ranks them. Um, and so I can look at all their profiles and pick out the ones that are maybe heavier in weaning weight, heavier in yearling weight, lower in birth weight, all the important uh, 
EPDs and measurements we that we use. Uh, the EPDs are it's expected progeny difference uh, is what that acronym stands for. And so we can use those to build uh, the next generation. So we want to improve in breeding beef cattle. We want to improve the next generation uh, above where the parents were. So that kind of a way of explaining that, I guess. So, um, so these will be taken on. Uh, some of these will be sold once I get all the evaluation done. Some of these will be sold. Uh, some of them we'll keep and put in uh, our replacement herds. And then when we put those into our replacement herd, we have some cows that are older, maybe not producing as well as they should. We, a term called call, C-U-L-L, -L, we'll call them, uh, uh, move them on to maybe another commercial cattle operation, or they go to the stockyards. So we're always, we're always looking to make improvement on that next generation. Great, awesome. Well, um, let's go ahead and head to the barn then, if that's okay, and kind of go through some of the things that you have in there and how you care for them and maybe how you, you know, tag them, things like that. And while you're doing okay. that, we'll kind of review the life cycle. Okay, very good. Great, thank you. Awesome. So now we're going to go ahead and just kind of walk back through the life cycle of cattle and what that looks like. Um, so if Dan wants to go ahead and put those up on the screen there. So the first stage of the beef life cycle, um, cows are bred and calves are born. So this is the cow calf stage. Um, like um, Keith has kind of shared with us, and this is primarily a lot of his operation. And, you know, a lot of his cattle spend a lot of time um, out on grass pasture. He raises Angus cattle, um, as he kind of had mentioned there. And I know some of you have asked those questions a little bit there. Um, and then moving into the next phase is weaning. And so, again, Keith talked on this a little bit, too, of how he weans his calves. And, you know, they are on their mothers between six to eight months. And then, you know, he kind of slips them off into that. So, and then just kind of moving a little bit further um, that, you know, then they'll move to maybe livestock auction markets and they can even then go to stalkers and backgrounders um, when they're older. But again, this isn't primarily, you know, where Keith spends most of his time. He spends them with them in their earlier years. Um, and keeps a couple, you know, obviously to keep his operation going. So that's really great. And I don't know if you want to, Dan, maybe switch back over to Keith's view. Um, they're driving past all of the equipment at the moment as they head back to the barn. So you can get a better up close and a little more personal view of those. They're gonna go ahead and head on towards the barn and we're gonna see a cattle shoe and Keith's going to share with us maybe a little bit more about what that is and you know if it's safe for cattle, things like that. So if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and start dropping those in and that way we can kind of get those answered for you. Great. Let's that focus a little bit there. Wait a minute. Come. Come. All right, Keith, you are good to go. Okay, thanks. Uh, right now, we've moved on into our working facility, our, our cattle handling equipment, and our setup here. Um, it's, uh, it's important to be able to handle the cattle safely for yourself and for the for the animals uh so you know instead of uh now out west they do it all horseback and they rope them and all but uh we don't have that kind of an operation here so we have what we call a chute a head gate and this opens up they can exit through the front or exit through the side and when they come in and we close this down behind their head and on their neck and that secures them so why do we have to have them in here 
we have to have them in here because we need vaccinations. Uh, we need to give them vaccinations just like you do before you start school. And then uh, like my grandson had to get junior high vaccinations the other day. So we do the same thing just to keep our cattle healthy. Uh, so when we get them in here, they're contained. Uh, you can give the shots. We, we work with uh, BQA uh, 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 regulations on injection sites. Uh, we inject in the neck, not in the muscle tissues of the high end cuts. Um, so th you have to pay attention to that uh, more so than you ever did before. So we're going to run a heifer in this shoot, and I'm going to show you the question came up earlier about the tags, and I'm going to show you how we uh, how we apply the tags and what other identification we use on these uh, calves, and then it carries them th carries through the their whole life. So can you kind of talk with us, Keith, maybe what's going on right now, just for everyone, because we can't see. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for our calf to come in. If, if you look over here, we have a holding pen where this animal is. Now Comrade Joe's is moving her to what we call a tub, and she's going to swing the tub gate shut, and that will crowd the calf into the alley. And as she comes down the alley, we will put her in the head gate. We'll close that gate behind her. And she knows something's different here. So I will <laughs> encourage her to, to get in here. Once her head pops through, Karma Joe closed the head gate. And now we have her confined. She may sway back and forth a little bit, but obviously she's pretty comfortable. And there again, this is where that docility thing really, really pays its benefits because she's not too excited about what's going on. Now, the cows have, all the females have red tag in. So since she's a weaned calf, we put the red tag in. And if she was the number 30 calf to be born this year in 2000, so we start with 2001, work all the way through. And then, so this individual is 2030. We also put our dams number on the tag, which is 1610. That's the number of her dam, her mother. And then the sire or the dad of this little heifer is uh, the sire's named inertia. So we have all the information there. We also have a birth date up here at the top, it's a little hard to read. We also, that's kind of not a permanent identification. So we do tattoo them for a permanent identification. And if we look real close, you can see all that green spot, the digits are there and her number 2030 is a tattoo in both ears. We put it between two ribs of the ear so that uh, we don't get into a lot of cartilage. And then when that dries up, that ink will be in, penetrated into the skin and you, it's a very readable tattoo. Um, also, we have a white button there. It's got a 15 digit unique number on it. And that number is unique to this individual. And we put them in as weaned calves and then that tag follows through the lifetime of this individual until she uh, end of life. So why is that important? Because she can be traced back here if there's ever a problem with uh, diseases or anything else, we know where that cow originated from. I will show you the devices that we use
this is what we use to tattoo. You can see the pointed uh, needle pointed digits on there. Uh, I don't know if it comes out on that or not, but you can see how it imprints into the ear. And once we uh, make that depression, we depress these and squeeze it into the skin and then use a tattoo ink to rub on it. And that's the, that's the green ink you see inside the ear. The tagger for the ear tag is this device. It's a sharp piercing uh, end that goes through the ear and then it kind of locks in. We also, a marking pen, we mark all that information on. Karma usually does that because she's a lot neater printer than <laughs> I am. But that information goes on the tag. You can buy pre-printed tags, but it's easier to do the blank tags and put the information on that you want. Great. Awesome. And then this, this is the apparatus that puts the white EID tag in that you see there. Uh, basically works on the same principle. It locks, once you compress it, it locks in and stays there. So probably pretty similar to how people get their ears pierced and things like that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's, yes, it's somewhat similar to that. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, we are getting close to time. Um, so I encourage everyone, if you have any last minute questions um, for Keith, I'm sure he would gladly answer. Um, and then, you know, if you have to jump off it, once the time hit, that's fine. But I'm sure he has a little bit um, of time that he can kind of help wrap things up with us here. So um, we do have a couple questions that have already come in. Um, do you use any grain with trucks and trailers and things like that? We do have a, a stock trailer, a 20 foot <laughs> stock tra aluminum stock trailer that we transport the cattle with. Yeah. Great. Um, another question was, are you able to take the tags off of the cattle if you need to? I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Do you, are you able to take the tags off of the cattle if oh, you need to? Good point. I'll show you what we do. Um, yes, we can take them off. I was looking for the tag remover and I can't find it. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, it's just a, it's a little device that you put on the back side and it's got a blade on it and you just pull it through. Here we go. This is it. And you just put it on the back side like this, pull it through and it cuts that, that piece off. So yes, awesome. they can be removed. That was a great question. And then um, another student has asked, do any of your cows ever get out of their pasture? And what do you have to do in order to get them back if they do get out? Uh, yes, that happens sometimes. Uh, and, and when they do get out on the road, you are liable for any accidents or anything that happens. So we, we take pretty good precautions to uh, keep that from happening. Although there's all kinds of different kinds of structures and fences that people use. You, you might have seen some board fence that we have here, some high tensile wire. Uh, and a lot of my perimeter fences are just two hot wires that are about uh, three feet off the ground uh, and about 18 inches between the two wires to keep the, the cattle in. Uh, as long as you have plenty of feed, uh, it's uh, grass and forages out there for them to eat, it's very likely that uh, they're going to get out and roam around. Uh, but it, occasionally it does happen. We have an electric fence. Uh, we've got a, a fence charger that shoots electric through the lines that uh, is pretty hot. And they get pretty well accustomed to, if they get shocked, they, they very rarely does it happen twice. So <laughs> it does keep them at bay. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, it's an important issue. Uh, and yeah. it rarely happens here, but 
but if you're along a road and uh, somebody runs off, we've had problems. We're an Amish country up here, and we've had trouble with buggies going through our fences more than cars. And <laughs> so uh, that does happen. And uh, rarely do they tell you that they went through the fence. So you find it and you fix it. And uh, so those things do happen. Yeah. Um, another question was that, do you ever have to milk your cows? We do not. Well, I shouldn't say never because uh, you could get a cow that produces more milk than the calf can take when it's a baby. Uh, and sometimes uh, there's a problem uh, that cows get in their udders called mastitis. It's an infection. Beef cows is pretty rare, um, but normally you don't have to. And that's one thing I talked about EPDs earlier. And that's one thing that's measured on EPDs is milk. Uh, so you can select for cows that have high milk production, medium milk production, or low milk production. So uh, you can kind of work that into your, your breeding system uh, and, and kind of stay away from those issues. Yeah, but these cows are uh, bred basically for beef, correct? Correct, yes. Great. And then one other question that came in, why do you, would you need to take the tags out ever? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get that question. You're fine. Why would we ever need to take the tags out of a cow's ear? When would you need to? Yes. Uh, very rarely would you have to. Uh, the, they're, I guess, semi-permanent. That white button, that's permanent. The ear tags are semi-permanent. We could, if we wanted to change it now, I, I, I can give you an example when we do that. The baby calf tags are smaller and we write all that information on a small tag. And then when they get weaned, they get the adult size tag. So yeah, that would be an indication, a, a situation where we would take the tag out. Yeah. Great. And then one final question we have here, when you're taking care of your cattle and you're checking them and things like that, what's the biggest thing that you're looking for? First thing you look for is everybody healthy. Is everybody staying together? Uh, cattle are gregarious. That means they move in groups. And when you see one that's not in a group and it's standing off by itself, uh, that's the first indicator that maybe something's wrong. So you go check it out. Uh, Cattle have issues sometimes with uh, respiratory problems, and you can see uh, respiration rates uh, if it's breathing harder. Uh, it's very obvious if they have a lot of mucus coming out of their nose, uh, then we know that uh, we need to get it in, check the temperature, and uh, treat it with antibiotics uh, if need be. Great, awesome. Well, that is all the questions that we have. So thank you again, Keith, for sharing your farming practices with us and your cattle operation. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone for um, jumping on today and listening to Keith's presentation and kind of show us around. So again, we really appreciate it. We hope you all have a great day and are walking away with a bit more information about cattle. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to do this.